This is an interesting panel for several reasons, but I'd like to set it up the way I see it. Last year, uh, Mayor Bloomberg asked me to give a speech, and I gave a very brief speech and said, it may be unfashionable, but I still believe we live in an interdependent world with common challenges and that cooperation is better than conflict, mm -hmm. that we have to find a way to get more win-win solutions, and that I believed in things like more trade, then have arguments about what's fair, but don't walk away from the international economy. I believed we had an obligation to help each other with our social challenges and our uh, difficulties of being proud of our respective identities and managing our diversity. And I thought we would either achieve, over the long run, inclusive prosperity or none at all, inclusive social solidarity or none at all. I still believe that. So maybe I'm old-fashioned, but I want to betray my deep prejudice in favor of that position. Um, on the other hand, though it was now nearly 20 years ago, I can still remember what it was like to be an elected politician. <laughs> and there's a big difference in having to deal with the fears, the conflicts, the emergencies of the moment, and, you know, floating above it all and being high-minded. We need both. But these three remarkably accomplished people have dealt with a set of unique challenges that deserve our respect and our attention. So even though we could spend the rest of the time we have repeating bromides about things we all believe, I think it's far more important that you hear from each of them from the root of their own experience. And so I'm going to start with President Ramaphosa. I've known him a long time. Um, he was elected to take South Africa in a new direction. They recently got a bad report. They, they lead the world in income inequality. Mm -hmm. The report didn't point out that from the time Nelson Mandela became president until 2011, they were reducing inequality. Poverty was going down. Progress was being made. He was elected as much as anything else to root out corruption in South Africa. It's a problem nearly everywhere to a greater or lesser degree, but too much of it can wreck democracy and in the end can even wreck a non-democratic system. But he got elected to make good things happen. So here, here's what a lot of potential investors are thinking about. Okay, I like this guy, Ramaphosa. He says he's going to get rid of corruption. And he made a lot of money in business. He understands the economy. <laughs> but he's promised to go back to land reform. The original animating purpose of his party decades ago, when Mandela was thrown in prison and all the others suffered as they did in ways they did. So he's got an interesting take on this, so I want to start with him. Okay, we all live in an independent world. We want to work together. We believe creative cooperation is better. You have to figure out what that means in terms of how are you going to get the economy going? How are you going to reduce inequality? How are you going to redeem the promise of land reform without screwing up the investment climate and making people trust you? Well, thank you very much, uh, President Clinton. And uh, let me start off by thanking you for being supportive for good causes around the world and also being very supportive for what we're doing in South Africa and for the wonderful relationship that you had with Nelson Mandela, 
uh, you and him struck a very wonderful friendship and relationship, and uh, we're eternally grateful for the support that you continue to give him. We face a number of challenges in South Africa. We're having to deal with the legacy of apartheid, a legacy that was solidified over hundreds of years, and uh, correctly so, as you said, when uh, my party was formed in 1912, it was really to undo what was set in place by the colonialists and by the apartheid system. And one of the key issues around which the ANC was formed was to redress the imbalances of the past, but also to deal with the land question. Land had been taken away from the majority of our people. In 1913, just a year after the ANC was formed, the land architecture was changed and delineated in a way where 87% of the land was given to just less than 8% of the population and 13% to the rest of the population. And that continued to be a wound and a sore in the hearts and minds of uh, South Africans because they took a view that here is, was an important economic resource that they had been locked out of, that they were not allowed to own, to control, or to participate in in a meaningful way. So over the 106 years, this has been a, saw, a festering sore, and the party that I lead felt that we had now reached a point where we needed to address it, and it came up with a resolution in conference that we should now move ahead with land reform, and in doing so, we should do it in a way where as we expropriate land and make sure that it is available to the majority of the population, we should ensure that it does not harm the economy, it advances agricultural production and also ensures food security. Now, what this has yielded is a wonderful, all-encompassing debate in South Africa. The majority of South Africans are involved in a debate and a discussion which is leading to collaboration. Many landowners are coming forward with solutions. We've had 650,000 proposals put forward to our parliament on how to resolve this. A number of those who own land are saying they want to be part of the solution rather than be part of the problem. A number of companies that own land are saying we don't really have business in owning land. We want to give it away. We want it to be in the hands of the people. And other landowners are saying we want 50-50 joint ventures. And so wonderful solutions are coming to the fore. And they are all aimed at ensuring that we get a solution that will lead to cohesion, social cohesion in South Africa, economic growth that will enable our economy to grow when all the people of South Africa are now utilizing the important resource that we have, land, in the best way possible. Now, with that, we think South Africans themselves will come up with solutions like they did when we resolved the apartheid problem. Apartheid was once seen as the most intractable problem in the world that could not be solved. But under the leadership and guidance of Nelson Mandela, we were able to resolve it. And similarly, now, his spirit, his values, and his Spirit, uh, his, uh, his principles and his vision is guiding us. We're not going to have land grabs. That is never going to be allowed. We're going to make sure that as we embark on land reform, it becomes all-inclusive, leads to nation building, social cohesion, economic development, which will benefit all the people of South Africa. The construct of apartheid was exclusion. Construct of a new democratic government is inclusion, that everybody should be included and benefit from the economic mm. process that we are engendering. As we deal with corruption, as we engender economic growth through investment, this is the trajectory that we have embarked on as South Africa. And we are very grateful 
that many people around the world are aware of the challenge we face and are seeking to assist us. So we're eternally grateful for all the support we can get in this. We'll come back to that. I was going to go this way, but I just got a note telling me that President Duque is going to miss his slot to speak at the UN. <laughs> <laughs> so you're up. Here's, here's <laughs> what I want to say. First of all, this man took office when he was four years younger than I was. So I really resent him. <laughs> uh, actually, I've been very impressed with the way you've handled this. But brief background for those of you who don't know a lot about Colombia. In 2000, one third of Colombia, one third of the whole country was in the hands of the narco traffickers and the gangs that supported them which included groups that had once been head of political dissidents like FARC and Yell and others. We started Plan Columbia. We gave them money to build up their law enforcement, build up their judicial system, support alternative economic paths, mostly for Colombia, to some extent for their Indian neighbors. President Pastrana was ending his term. President Uribe came in. Then President Santos came in. Within a few years, <clears throat> Colombia belonged to Colombians again. There was a two-thirds reduction in coca planting. The peace process proceeded. Part of the peace process called for a relaxation of uh, the prosecution of the, in effect, the changes. And guess what? The coca production rose again to record levels. He was elected in a difficult environment with a large margin because he offered the promise of a future that was more drug-free, more gang-free, more violence-free, but still more peaceful and inclusive. He's up there walking a tightrope in a magnificent country that is the second oldest democracy in all the Americas, full of unbelievable resources. So before you go to the UN, tell us what tell them what you want them to know about Colombia and how it's one thing to say you're for peace and inclusion and quite another thing to achieve it when there's an unlimited amount of money coming from narco trafficking to do everything possible to undermine the future you want to build. Well, thank you, President Clinton, for your kind words. And I must also thank you, because when you were president of the United States, you began Plan Colombia. And you did it because you knew that the best way that Colombia could develop was bringing down illegal crops and opening development opportunities. So when Plan Colombia began in 1999 until 2012, <laughs> We not only reduce illegal crops from 180,000 hectares to 50,000 hectares, but the government and the business climate changed for the positive good of the whole nation. And we became a country that was well recognized worldwide for those achievements, and we brought investment and we expanded the middle class. Now, there, is, there was a peace process with FARC in the last years, and it's positive. But what we don't want to suffer in Colombia is a major setback. And what we have seen in the last five years is that illegal crops are now higher than the times when you signed Plan Colombia, and we don't want that to continue. So I have said that everybody who's involved in the peace process that is truly going to a reconciliation process, we are going to help them. We want them, we want them to succeed. We want the investment to go to the places that violence was, was present so we can make a change. But we also have to be very clear that lasting peace can only be built with law and order. Mm -hmm. So if there are people who are going back to criminality, we're going to bring them to justice. It's the only way. But we have also to call for international attention that in order to make that substitution of illegal crops viable and sustainable, we need to have legal crops that have accessibility to the markets we have opened, to the US, to, to Europe, 
to Africa, to different places in, in the world. And that's something that we have to do, and we're doing it right now. Bringing back law and order, but at the same time, creating fair trade, sustainable trade, so that we can have a, su a sustainable uh, substitution of illegal crops. And I build my agenda for Colombia based on three pillars. Law and order, legality, entrepreneurship, because we want to be a country that is always more business friendly, that is open for a small, medium-sized enterprise to keep on growing and innovating. And the third thing is that if we have legality and entrepreneurship, the consequence is equality. And that means closing the gaps, mm -hmm. gender gaps, income gaps. And I feel very proud to be the first Colombian president to have a paritary, equalitarian cabinet, men and women, 50% men, 50% women. Mm -hmm. And I also feel very proud that we are mobilizing investment to technology, to agricultural development. And my goal is that by the end of our term, we'll be very close to putting an end to extreme poverty. So those are the challenges we face. I know they're hard, but I know we're going to achieve it if we get the Colombian people to unite in that common purpose, Mr. President. Mm -hmm. I do want to say, and I think you would agree with this, it's still less violent than it was. It's, yes, mm -hmm. of course. And so the trick is, what happened was they had a peace agreement in which they agreed to basically lay off the rural areas a little bit, and what you said happened. This is one of the things all of you have a challenge is think about this. If you have a commodity that can generate the kind of money that the cocoa can, then he has to have sufficient law enforcement in the rural areas, as well as make mm -hmm. political deals, because people go where the money is. And we, all over the world, we are having trouble finding ways for rural people to make a decent living in a legal way. So we wish you well. I know you have to go to the UN. But yeah, sorry that I'm going to miss the rest of the panel, but I have to <laughs> go and deliver my Thank speech. Thank you. So. Go. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. And we had an international coffee conference there last year. We had people growing coffee from all over the world come to Colombia because they have the capacity to grow more, as does Africa. Prime Minister Tolbert, you would seem at first blush say, why is she on this panel? <laughs> Do they have any problems in Norway? <laughs> I want those problems. I want to be Norway when I grow up, right? <laughs> Oil revenues, environmental responsibility, burying carbon dioxide back in under the North Sea, a huge sovereign wealth fund, and massive development aid, the first country in the world to meet the UN target of giving seven-tenths of 1% 1 of its GDP in development aid, and a broad consensus across political parties that this ought to be done. So what's your take on where we are in the world today? How can we get other people who otherwise think like you to continue to be committed to global trade, global development? Hmm. And how is your country dealing with the upheaval caused in Europe by the massive influx of refugees, mostly from violence in the Middle East? Mm. Well, start off, I know that we cannot produce a history like South Africa or, or Colombia, I, and, uh, but we are maybe more representative of a lot of European countries that are, are troubled with new types of challenges. I think globalization has been a win-win situation in the world, uh, both for uh, especially for developing countries, the fact that we have lifted so many people out of, of uh, poverty. But of course, you have, you have a disparity between what happens for people inside those countries that usually were the part of the global society. Poor people, low income, low education, who now feel themselves threatened. And I think that is a European issue today, to make sure that you have open economy, that you have trade as we still step forward on globalization, because technology will drive this globalization, whatever politicians are going to say, because the technology now will move that. 
But how can we as politicians be able to do what we did not well enough the last decade to make sure that people who feel threatened by the jobs that move out of the country or just are removed by technology, in fact, see some type of future? How can we make sure that we have educational system? How do we make sure that we don't just train people when they're 16, 18, and 20, but start to train 40-year-olds? As usually when I give a speech, I say, I'm seven years old. I still learn new things, so why shouldn't we be more invested in 57-year-old women should work much longer in, the, in our workforce, and we, but we have to be invested in for re-education, for training, and to do that. And I think that's a, to remember that the basis always is to make sure that the people of your country can continue to feel that they measure and, and, and they manage their own lives. And I think that's, that's the common challenge. I think if you're a developing country, if you're an industrialized country, everything of that is to make sure that you, you have that fundamental, that you're focusing on how, what is the challenge for people to participate and be in control of their own life, to make a livelihood, to make sure that they can have a family. Uh, and for example, if you look at Europe, with, we have had so high youth unemployment for so long, it's going down now. That's one of the big challenges. I know they want us to wrap up, but you have to answer a question for, because it affects his future. Yeah. Norway has been, as I said, very generous in development aid. They have supported, uh, full disclosure, our foundation's efforts in fighting AIDS, TB, and malaria in Africa, and in promoting climate change initiatives that are economically viable. South Africa has received a lot of that. What do you say in this time of the so-called Brexit mentality about why you did the right thing in supporting investments to help South Africa rise from the largest AIDS burden in the world, now leading the world not only in fighting AIDS, but also tuberculosis, which is now killing more people than AIDS? And he has done a, they're doing a great job mm. there. So what do you say to people that if they say, why are you doing this? We're all going up in smoke here. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm usually saying that for a country like Norway, and I believe for all other countries, the, uh, we are a global village. When people are hurt in somewhere else, if they are polluting somewhere else, it will affect us. So we need global solutions, and it's affect... Uh, a high response in Norway, 70% of our voters say that we should use development aid. They might argue that some of the development aid projects is not good enough, is not effective enough, there's too much bureaucracy or corruption, but they are in favor of uh, a system of uh, giving development aid. And I think the results that we have seen through the uh, investment through Gavi for va vaccines on fighting HIV, where Norway has supported quite a lot, I think the results are so uh, convincing. The reason why we have halved, uh, halved uh, uh, the deaths of children f from 2001, 2000 to 2015 in the world, the first five years, it's because we've done these health investments. And this is a story of why we should work together. And that's also why we, for example, have now created with a couple of other countries what we call CEPI, which is an, which is an initiative to make sure that we are do working on vaccines before we get the illnesses, before we get the epidemics and pandemics, so we have a preparedness for that, which we think is, uh, it will hit us all. If they start to get ill in South Africa, it will hit Norway. Yeah. It might take a year, it might take two. If it's really a pandemic, it will come within weeks. Excellent. I'll give you the last word. What do you say? If people say, this is a very impressive presentation you made, <laughs> but we're just not buying it. <laughs> you just got too much baggage here with all these problems. Why should I invest in South Africa right now? What do you say? Last word. Well, I would say that what we're seeking to do on the land question is to manage risk to minimize the risk, but at the same time, 
We're doing a whole lot of other things. We're working on policy issues to ensure that there's policy certainty and consistently. And this we've arrived at after talking to the business sector, to the unions, and we all agree that if we address this, we will begin to see the investment community looking at, South, at South Africa in a different way. We're going to an investment conference in October where we're hoping to raise $100 billion in the next five years. And already we've got quite a lot of interest and I invite everyone here who is a would-be investor to come to South Africa because we open for business, we open for investment, and we're solving a whole lot of problems from corruption to dysfunctional governance to a whole lot of other issues on the policy side. South Africa is being repositioned and repackaged for good investments. We still have great resources that people should get an interest in. So A, we're ready to go, and B, we're open for business. Mm -hmm. And finally, if you want them to do land reform in a way that does not involve expropriation, which he has promised not to do, then they need to be able to make a living in rural areas, which means they need investment from sovereign wealth funds and wealth generally, and they need social progress. Mm. These two people, I think, are quite remarkable in very different circumstances from slightly different politics. They prove that no matter what anybody else tells you, cooperation works better yeah. than constant conflict. And winning in politics and economics and society is not a zero-sum game, it's a positive-sum game yeah. in the 21st century. The, we, if you have an interdependent world, we are going to have inclusive prosperity and inclusive social policies and inclusive politics, or we're going to spend all our time squabbling over who gets a bigger piece of a smaller pie. That's the larger decision that is behind everything they do. And I think we should support them.